Well, welcome back to Basic Training. Uh, we're so glad to have you here once again. I know for me today, it's kind of a cloudy, rainy day. It's great to be inside with a cup of coffee and the Bible. And I am so looking forward, though, though I don't get to see you face to face, uh, to this time together of learning and breaking bread together in God's Word. Praise God. You know, a disciple is a disciplined follower of Jesus, someone who is dedicated to uh, hearing the Word of the Master and putting it into practice in daily life. And so no matter where you are in your journey with God, whether you just got saved uh, this morning or you've been walking with God a long time, I know that uh, you're going to profit from the time that you take uh, to take part in these studies. And so uh, hopefully you've got your um, workbook downloaded, the basic training study guide. And what we'd like to do is open up to this second lesson entitled, What Happened in the Garden of Eden? Such an exciting study. And I tell you, uh, you know, when you grow up in the world and, and you believe there's a God and you look around you and you see all the chaos and the wars and the famines and the tragedies, it raises questions, legitimate good questions. And this teaching right here will answer so many questions and open up so many truths to you. So I just pray that your mind is alert and your heart is open as we dive into this study today. So on my page, it's page number five. And so we're going to uh, begin in Genesis chapter one, if you want to turn there. And we're going to talk about what actually happened in the Garden of Eden. I always tell people there's critical things if you want to understand. Uh, salvation, what God's doing today, uh, what salvation means for the believer, is you need to understand what happened in the Garden of Eden, what God did about it, and what it means for you and I today. And so three things, what happened in the Garden of Eden, what God did about that, what were the consequences of that, of, of that event, and what God did about it, and what it means, most importantly, for you and I today. And so this study, Roman numeral number one, if you have your pen there, is about God's overall plan for mankind. So you write in the blanks as we go. The answer is plan. Genesis chapter one unveils for us the overarching, the primary reason, the plan of God for mankind. And so let me just read from the handout. God creates in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis one and one. Uh, he creates the universe, the galaxies, the planets, the solar system, the earth, and all the plants and all the animals. So you could see here that God creates a place of fantastic beauty. You know, we walk around in some of the places on the earth I've been able to go and see, even under the curse of sin for more than 6,000 years, around 6,000 years, the planet is still such a place of beauty. You wonder what it must have looked like before the fall. So God creates a place of fantastic beauty that would meet man's every need. Before God created man and placed him on the earth, he saw fit uh, so that there was no good thing that man would not have available for him. Then he received, man did, the breath of life from his creator and he became a living being. The lesson to take out of this is that God wants all of his creation and especially his man to enjoy all of his best blessings. The very, if you study Genesis 1 carefully, you'll see that the very first words that mankind hears in his new ears is God's commandment on their lives to be blessed, to have dominion, to be fruitful, and to multiply. And so you can see no matter what has happened since then, God's original plan for you and for me is that we be blessed. So let's go on here, uh, B under Roman numeral number one. Man's glorious creation, Genesis 1.26. This is a verse of scripture that you must understand and know about. It says, then God said, let us, to the word us is a pronoun referring to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So the first blank is our image. And the next blank is our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And so you could see here that man is God's, in God's design, 
is created on a very high level. Notice he said he wanted, uh, they decided, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, to make man in our image and our likeness. So let's look at this word image. I give you the definition there in the book. It means a likeness, a statue, a profile, or a representation, a resemblance. So God created Adam in his likeness. Adam resembled God to all creation. When God created, when, excuse me, when creation looked at Adam, it was difficult uh, for creation to tell the difference between Adam and God until there was a close inspection. Literally, man was created to be a representation of God on the earth. Now, I know that that rattles, you know, religious brains, but it is the Word of God and it is a sacred truth that the Bible teaches. The next phrase, our likeness, says this. It, it means structure, by implication a resemblance, a likeness, a form, and specifically a pattern. So in the word image, man was to look like God, he was to act like God, but this second word likeness means pattern. This speaks more to how man was to conduct himself in the created sphere that God placed for him. That in uh, Eden, in the earth, he was to pattern himself after God. How did God, for instance, how did God create the universe? We know that God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let there be a firmament, and there was a firmament. Well, man in, in his conduct was to pattern himself just like that. So man became in creation a speaking spirit. Later on, one of my favorite verses Jesus spoke on the subject of faith is Mark eleven twenty three, 23. And of course there he said, uh, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and will not doubt in his heart, but believes that the things that he says will come to pass, he will have whatsoever he says. Well, see, this is exactly the way God created man to be able to conduct himself on the earth before the fall, to be able to speak just like God did, to believe in his heart, and for those things that he spoke to come to pass. Praise God. So God made a pattern of himself, uh, and then he made formed Adam to fit into that pattern that he had made. In other words, like father, like son. All right, let's move on now. So, God gives man dominion. Let's look again at Genesis 1.26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. We've studied that. Let them have dominion. So the word there is dominion. Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, of course, Though Adam was created, mankind was created in the likeness of God, in the image of God, we're not God. And it does not say that God gave man dominion over God, certainly not. But notice, in the sphere of earth, in the sphere of this realm, uh, praise God, we do have dominion. Uh, that was God's original intent uh, in creation. So this word dominion, we, we, we think we know what it means, and we're pretty much right about it. It means be Lord, to reign, and then the blank there is rule, R-U-L-E. Dominion means to rule or to be in charge. It means to have the mastery of, to govern, to have jurisdiction, to be great, and to be powerful. And so I like that word govern too. God gave Adam and Eve man's first representatives, our first parents, if you will, the ability and the right to govern on the earth. So if you turn the page. This meant that God handed all dominion, governing authority and power to Adam after creating him. This is so important that you understand this for what's coming next. God let Adam be the Lord of the earth and to reign over the entire jurisdiction of the earth. Nothing else God created could resist Adam's dominion because it covered all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So, now we're about to move into something deeper here. I hope you have this foundation. I know you can't ask me questions right now. This was God's original plan for man, to rule and to reign on the earth. 
in perfect fellowship with Him. And that is still God's plan today. All right, well, we know that some things happen, though, right? Uh, let, let's move on here to Roman numeral number two. We'll see something else very interesting. God instructs Adam and Eve about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it's concerning this tree that things begin to go wrong for man. But let's begin to understand some things about this tree, the tree of, the, of knowledge of good and evil. Let's look at God's command concerning the tree, and that's in Genesis 2, verse number 17. So Genesis 2, verse number 17, and of course you have it here, but I'll read it here from the Word. It says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. Wow. So we see here that God told Adam that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil belonged to the Lord. And it was the only tree that God commanded uh, Adam not to eat of. And the penalty for breaking this commandment would be death. Well, let's ask ourselves, why would God do this? Why uh, was the tree necessary? Well, I give you three points to think about. Because there is no free moral will in mankind without the option to both choose God and to not choose God. And so God provided them a choice. So in creation, God gave man something very, very special and something very, very powerful. And it is the right of choice. Apart from God's influence, He gives you and I the right, the ability, apart from His influence, to choose to obey Him or not to obey Him. Now, why would God do this? Well, because God didn't want to create robots to have a family with. That wouldn't be a real relationship. So, uh, the second bullet there. By choosing to not eat of the tree, Adam and Eve expressed a willingness to love and to obey God, their Creator, and that was pleasing to God. So every time they're walking in the garden and they see this tree of the knowledge of good and evil and they chose to obey God, to not eat of the fruit thereof, they demonstrated a sincerity, a love and a submission and obedience to God that made their relationship with God special and unique. So the third thought here is God's greatest desire, that's the blank, greatest, God's greatest desire is that we choose to love Him. And you know, He loves you, but His greatest desire is that you take that free moral will He gave you and that you choose to love Him back. And He is not going to make anyone choose Him. He's not going to make anyone want to be where He is. Now, He lives in heaven. And, but you know, God's not going to force anyone to go to heaven. So the alternative to heaven is a place called hell. <laughs> and we'll get to that in a little bit. Roman numeral number three. God instructs Adam and Eve about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So Eve is tempted, we know, by Satan. And she ends up eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eve then takes that fruit, gives it to her husband Adam, and he eats of it as well. So you remember that a big part of what I want you to understand this study is what happened in the Garden of Eden? So first of all, we know what happened in the beginning according to God's will. We've studied that. That they be blessed and that they have dominion and they enjoy fellowship with God unfettered and they're in charge and they're blessed in every way. That was God's original will and plan. We know He gave them one commandment. We know that they fell. And so we're talking about now what happened in the Garden of Eden. Well, they disobeyed God at some point. Well, let's look at consequences of the fall. In other words, what happened? Well, because Adam and Eve yielded themselves to Satan, they handed their dominion and their authority over to Satan. And he becomes the God, little g, of this world. Now, this is going to answer a lot of questions for you. How comes, how, why is there sickness and disease? Why the wars and the tragedies? Well, it, it's answered right here for you. 
There's a very interesting scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, and you don't have to turn there. I give you the whole scripture right in your handout. Have you ever noticed this scripture? It says, In whom the God of this world, notice it's not capitalized, little g, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that the light of the gospel of the glory of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, would not dawn upon them. Notice he's referring to someone who is the God, little g, of this fallen world system. Well, who is that? Who is that? Who is the God of this world? It's Satan. It's Satan. Did you realize this is the implications of this? When Adam and Eve sinned, they basically handed the keys of the earth over to Satan's great uh, adversary, the devil. Now, Adam didn't have a moral right to do that, but he did have a legal right to do it. And he turned the keys over to the devil. And the devil now has the keys to the earth. He is in possession of that God-given dominion that, Ad, that God placed in Adam's hand. So, in light of this, we move, we're moving on now. Man loses his fellowship with God because they had now taken on the sin nature. So when, before the fall, they had God's nature. They didn't know they were naked. They were clothed with the fire and the glory and the presence of God. And they were God's little g in the earth. They were in charge. But when they sin, now they've taken on Satan's nature. Now their nature is fallen. It's a wicked nature. It's full of fear, full of death, full of bondage. We call that the sin nature. And this is the fundamental problem of what, it, of what sin is. Man is now subjected to sin, separation from God, poverty, sickness, and death. So this is what happened in the Garden of Eden. Sin, consciousness, and fear, top of page 7, immediately began to dominate and control Adam and Eve. You remember they hid from God's presence. The first thing they sensed was fear after they had taken on. They lost the glory and taken on the sin nature. And now instead of God being their father and God, now they're being lorded over by the devil. And did you know today that every evil, wicked person, every unsaved person is dominated? To some degree or another, they're dominated by the God of this world, the devil. And it's the devil that is propagating all the sickness and the disease and the death. You know, someone told me recently they had an argument in their high school uh, hallway. Uh, some students saying that God was making, if someone was sick with cancer, it was God that did that. No, it wasn't. It's a consequence of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And it's a work, an evil work propagated by the God, little g, of this world, the devil. We need to understand that, get our thinking straightened out. So understanding what happened because of the fall is a key to understanding why tragedy, sickness, poverty, and death exist. And why God simply cannot step in and stop it. Adam gave dominion for a specified time to the earth to Adam, which Adam in turn turned it over to the devil. And that means that Satan, until that time runs out, Satan's got a legal right to be down here. He's got a legal right to the earth until Jesus' return. You see, God, Satan's not like this, but God only moves in legal terms. He only does what's right. He can't just intervene legally and rip the keys to the earth, Adam's dominion, back out of the devil's hand until the lease, if you will, on the earth runs out. So... Man and Adam had gotten himself in a pickle. So we've talked about what happened in the Garden of Eden. Now let's talk about what God did about it. Thank God He did something about it. This is Roman numeral number four. As bad as the situation seems, God prophesies about the coming seed of the woman that will bruise the head of the devil. That's uh, Genesis 2.15. This is the very first prophecy in the Bible about a coming Messiah. That's M-E-S-S-I-A-H. A Savior. Thank God, right in that moment of judgment and sin, God promises and prophesies a Savior, a Messiah. God already knew the end from the beginning. 
And he had had a plan in place to redeem those, to buy back those that he had created in his image and after his likeness. Yeah, that makes, I say glory to God, and it makes me want to get up and shout, praise God. But for the next 4,000 years of human history, as you read your Bible, from Genesis on into the New Testament, you're seeing God laying the groundwork to manifest a Savior for the world. So let's look for a moment at God's plan of redemption, Roman numeral number 5. Why did Jesus have to come to the earth? Well, this is very important. Why did Jesus, why couldn't God just from heaven forgive man <laughs> and do a do-over, if you will? Well, this couldn't be undone. When God speaks, His word will have to come to pass. Notice, man had the keys of dominion to the earth and man gave it to the devil. A man lost dominion, therefore a man would have to get it back. This is why God became flesh. This is why it's necessary to believe in an immaculate conception that Jesus, who's fully God, became a man. Because it was man who lost authority, becoming a man was the only way that God could gain back what was lost. Romans 5.19 says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. Now we know how. So by the obedience of one man referring to Jesus, many will be made righteous. Jesus came to live as a man and to take our place of punishment for Adam's disobedience. Through the shedding of His blood, we receive the forgiveness of sins and we escape the dominion of Satan. Ephesians 1.7 says about Jesus, In whom, Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Colossians 1.13 is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, who, has, who Jesus has delivered us from the power or the authority, in the Greek that word is authority, of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. So the plan of salvation is Jesus became a man, He suffered in man's place, and He redeems man out from the dominion of the God of this world, Satan. And He takes us out of that dominion and places us back where God always wanted us to be, under the dominion of our Heavenly Father, the Father God. Praise God. Well, the final result. We've seen what happened in the Garden of Eden, what God now has done about it, and what now let's look finally as we close, what it means for us today. The final result, page 8. God's original plan for man will ultimately be fulfilled in that, in Jesus Christ through the new birth, we receive eternal life. Life is the answer there. In redemption, excuse me, in redemption, we regain dominion over the earth. Now, until Jesus comes back to the earth, Satan has a right. But see, now as a born-again believer, not me, not my household, the, the, the place of authority I occupy, I'm not conducting myself in that place anymore from Satan's dominion. Out there in the world, there are tragedies. Out there in the world, there's sickness, there's the curse, there's death, there's poverty, there's wars. But see over here in Jesus, and if you'll stick with this discipleship program, I'm going to teach you how to conduct yourself as a believer so that you can live under the canopy of God's blessing, live under the shelter of the Most High God, and live in divine protection, live in peace, live in provision, live in health. So you make me a promise. You stay with me. You pay attention. We're going to learn some things as we move ahead. It says here then that we are restored to our position of righteousness with God. No longer in the new birth are we sinners. And we're going to study this in the next lesson, Lesson 3. But we're now made right with God like Adam was before the fall. We are redeemed from sickness, poverty, and spiritual death. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Ultimately, Satan... And all those who reject Christ are going to be unseated from their place of authority, and they will be cast into the lake of fire. 
God the Father has His dream fulfilled. The plan He had for man from the beginning will ultimately be consummated in the earth. He will eventually come to the earth Himself to be our God, and we will be His people. Let's read as we close a closing verse about a future event that you and I can look forward to. Revelation 21.3 And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them, and He will be their God. Let me say to you, friend, if you're watching this somewhere around the world and you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know, could you see, even though there's a lot of teaching yet to come in this series, God planned a great plan for man, but sin messed that plan up very bad. And because of the sin nature Adam took upon himself, Satan's nature, he spread that to every human being that's been born since. And trying to be a good person is not going to be enough to undo it. Because down on the inside of you, in that spirit, you have a... It's the disease of sin, the nature of sin. And the only way to get rid of that, to be free of it, is to have your spirit recreated, to be born again. And the only way that you can do that is through the man Christ Jesus. God has done something about the fall. He sent His Son Jesus to die in your place. And all you have to do is to say out loud from a believing heart, Oh, Father, I take Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I repent of my sins. I, I, I want to get out from underneath the dominion of the devil. And I want to come in and be saved. I believe, this is what you say, I believe that God took Jesus and made Him my sacrifice. He took my place. And I believe God raised Him from the dead. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Make me new on the inside. And if you believe that, He will. He will, and you'll be born again. And you will, that very moment, escape the sin nature of the devil. And you'll become a child of God. If you said something like that from a believing heart, you prayed that prayer, would you find that email link on our website, contact us, and let us know that you were born again? We'd love to contact you, send you something, and it would just be an encouragement to us. Praise God that you're in the family. And I encourage you, tomorrow, the next day, or right now, click on that next video, and let's move on in our study together. God bless you.